have uh, Carl Heinz Meyer. So Carl Heinz has been a, a particle physicist in his previous life. Uh, uh, worked in the software infrastructure uh, for CERN, the LHC, to discover the Higgs boson. But 15 years ago or so, got uh, interested in brain-inspired computing. Uh, has led a couple of major projects in uh, uh, in developing brain-inspired computing systems. And in 2009, was. Uh, uh, one of the initiators for the European Human Brain Project and leads the sub-area for uh, brain-inspired computing. So, uh, thanks, Carl Heinz, for coming. Thank you, John, for the nice introduction. Of course, I also admire your appearance here at this conference. Like the first speaker, I also agree with the first speaker that CMOS probably has a great future. And I will show you one way of using CMOS in the future by uh, having a new computing architecture, which is a neuromorphic computing. Now, of course, what we look at here is the brain. And this is what you all have in your head now. It looks more pretty in your case now. But if you really go inside, this is what it looks like. And it's, it's, it's a complex system. It consists of 10 to the 11 nodes, which we call neurons. There's a huge number of connections, like 10 to the 15. It is a stochastic device, as you will see later in my talk. And probably the most important thing is it's not static, it's not stable. It changes all the time, and it changes all the time because it's driven by external signals, uh, like for example by your ears or your eyes. And of course you also feed back what you see to the environment. And it's that kind of closed loop which leads to an effect which is probably the most exciting thing of this device. That it is able to learn and to self-organize, and so it doesn't need any software to actually do useful information processing. Now why would you get involved with, as a computer scientist with the brain. And there are actually two reasons. One is, of course, to, to support neuroscience and to understand better how the brain works. Of course, you say, well, I can probably do that by experiments and maybe by simulation on conventional computers, but I will argue that that will be very hard, if not impossible. But, of course, there is the second application area of uh, brain-inspired computing, and that is to take principles of computing from the brain to actually do generic information processing and to do what the brain is really doing well. It's not doing numerical calculation. Try to calculate 312 times 15. It will take you a while. Your cell phone is much better than that. But of course, what you can do is to find patterns in space and time to make predictions uh, and similar things. This is what's typically called cognitive computing. And, and that's probably the most exciting application on the long term of uh, neuromorphic systems. Now, if you look to the brain uh, as a neurobiologist, and I'm not a neurobiologist, but I really like this kind of picture which has been produced by Terry Stanyowski, a really famous neuroscientist, and he says, well, the brain is a multi-scale system. We know that, like, I mean, it's like the weather in a way, where you have things happening at different scales, and the brain, those scales are really physically, spatial scales are visibly visible physically under a microscope. You see that there are neurons. You see that there are new uh, synapses. You actually can see brain areas with the right imaging techniques. And what you see in this plot is actually that there are seven orders of magnitude in spatial scale, in distance scale, from the synapse uh, uh, scale to the, to the full brain. And there are, and that's the frightening thing, and actually the big challenge, there are 11 orders of magnitude in time. How is that coming? Well, typically, brains consist of neurons that spike, that it, 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 it produced these kind of action potentials which at the millisecond or sub-millisecond level and of course you all know that the time to learn things and to self-organize is months or years. This is where the 12 or 11 orders of magnitude come from. So what neuroscience does is amazing. You see these colorful objects there in the plot and that are the, those are the methods that neuroscience has developed to actually map the function of the brain in space and time. So there's a lot of knowledge we have and we have to use this knowledge for both things, to help neuroscience to understand how these scales actually interact, but also then to derive computer architectures that are useful for generic computation. So the first thing you can do is just, this is a multi-scale system, it's relatively easy to map to a supercomputer. There are neurons, and, and they're working in parallel, so it's extremely easy to just map them to a supercomputer. This is work done by Marcus Diesmann, who was also a member of the Human Brain Project, and he used one of the world's biggest supercomputers um, the K computer in Japan, which the study is a couple of years old, but what you see, the number of compute nodes on the uh, horizontal axis, and then the network size, which is the, uh, uh, just the number of neurons, all right? And so this is what I call the spatial scale, it's the space which is plotted on the left axis, and what you see is that the concept of weak scaling, which is really a drastic approach to weak scaling, it works extremely well, okay? So, uh, in a way, the number of compute nodes and uh, 
is increased and in a proportional fashion you put 20,000 euros typically on a compute node, you increase the number of uh, the size of a network and you get constant performance in terms of computing. You see the flat line at the bottom is basically flat, uh, so it means the compute time stays constant. Now, of course that's not true. If you look at it, this is a logarithmic scale on the right side and this is time, it's not flat. And this is a logarithmic scale, you see that there are quite some deviations from weak scaling. Which doesn't interest me so much at the moment. What I'm more interested in is the absolute number of the runtime on, on, on the right axis. So it says 10 to the 3. What is this? It means it's a factor 10 to the 3 compared to biological real time. And that is kind of a problem. And it's a problem for, for two reasons. Uh, so this is the computer people are using. It's, they put these 65,000 processors and, uh, and uh, a billion very simple neurons. They call it 1% of the brain. So it's not really a brain. It's a very, very simple network model. It's more a computer science study. And this machine consumes a power of 13 megawatts, and the system runs 1,500 times slower than real-time biology. You all know that energy is power times time, and it means this system is, if you compare it to the human brain, 10 billion times less energy efficient, Okay, which is a bad news. But on the other hand, you can say, well, if you want to understand the brain, you are probably willing to invest a lot of energy, because there's a very really important basic knowledge coming out of that. What is more crucial and more critical, and to me, really prohibitive, in using these machines for brain science almost, is that you have to wait four years for a simulated day. And a day is nothing in the life of a brain. But it is typically where you learn, if you take into account development, that is really rewiring the structure of your brain, which takes many, many years at the beginning of your life. These time scales are just simply inaccessible on conventional computers. And that will not change if you go to the exascale. So one of the ways out is neuromorphic computing, and there are various definitions for that. This is my own private definition, because often people say, well, neuromorphic computing, that means building artificial brains. And of course, that's nonsense. We are not able to build an artificial brain, because there are so many things of the brain that we don't understand. There are cells, for example, which by far dominate over neurons, which are the glial cells, and we don't really know what they do. But what we can do is we can implement some aspects, some known aspects of structure and function of the biological brain and put that on an analog or digital substrate. And, and I don't really care at the moment whether that's analog or digital. I will show you two examples for that. Now, by structure, I mean that's what you see if you look under a microscope, cells, networks um, and with, with arms of axons and dendrites and of course the connecting points which are the synapses. What I consider far more important at the end is the function. Of course, you want these things to function. You don't just want to look at pretty pictures of structure which you see on many websites, but what you really want to see how this thing processes information and there's local processing going on in the cells like the the neuron in particular, but also the synapses, there is communication through the fibers, ingoing and outgoing fibers, dendrites and axons, which form the network, and of course there is what I call dynamics here, there is the fact that these connections actually change with time, uh, which is often then called learning, development, plasticity, self-organization, there are many words for that. Uh, let me show you some concrete example from our project, the Human Brain Project, which operates something that is called the Neuromorphic Computing Platform. And at this very moment, we are having two machines that are operational, I will show them, and they are really two fundamentally different approaches to brain spine computing, or to neuromorphic computing. There is the Spinnick project run by Steve Ferber, actually one of the inventors of the ARM architecture. I'm sad to say that in the presence of so many genius Intel guys here, but this system is running with the ARM architecture, and, and Steve has built a system of half a million ARM cores. And the rationale behind is, is, is that ARM cores are cheap, they cost nothing, at least if you make them very simple, but what you really have to invest in to overcome this weak scaling problem, not being able to weakly scale, which you have seen on the conventional supercomputers, he really implemented a router on his, each of his chips, which is able to very efficiently communicate via this action potential those spikes between um, individual ARM cores. And this is a system that's currently operational in Manchester, and I will tell you a little bit more about this. The other approach is what we do ourselves, which we call a physical model system. It's a bit like the quantum computers, that, that you have a, a, a real system in nature, and then you sort of rebuild it uh, on, on a substrate with, with uh, quantum objects that you can manipulate. So we actually make physical models of cells, of neurons and synapses. Of course, we are not using biological substrates, but we use CMOS, actually. 
but it's analog local computing and the communication is binary but continuous in time. So technically this is a mixed signal CMOS approach. In reality it's really pretty much how the real brain works. And the interesting thing there is you can of course also nicely scale this to a billion synapses or so. But this thing is running, you can it change the parameters, set the parameters so that it's running in an accelerated mode. Okay, so let's, uh, a few words on the many core system. Uh, the Spinnaker si uh, uh, system has 18 ARM cores, relatively simple ARM cores, only, only uh, integer operations, arithmetic on a chip uh, running at 200 megahertz. So that's all very unspectacular. And there's memory, of course, there's shared system RAM on die and the DRAM stacked on the die. But the real interesting thing is that the system has bidirectional links to other chips, and this is sort of a mini internet where the packages are actually small. They are optimized to transmit biological spikes. And the system can submit 6 million spikes per second per link, and it acts as a real-time simulator. It's a real-time simulator which really makes almost perfect weak scale a reality. The other approach is, is uh, the, the sort of mixed signal approach where the local cells are analog. And I show you this kind of little silly circuit, which is of course far from was really on our system, but everybody in this room, I hope, can understand this differential equation, which is there on the left side, which is just a Kirchhoff uh, type equation, energy conservation, which tells you how the system develops in time. And of course, there's the characteristic time constant, which is given by the product of the capacitance and the resistance or um, the conductance as is expressed here, which is one over resistance. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look to parameters, of course, you compare biology to VLSI, Typically, VLSI has very, very small capacitances uh, to um, compare to biology and, and, and higher conductances. And that means that you can actually have time constants which are accelerated compared to biology. This is just the decay time constants of the RC element. Now, of course, this is a linear circuit here. It's very simple. Neurons are highly nonlinear. If you approach the threshold, they fire, they produce this kind of, of, uh, of standard pulse, which we call an action potential. And there are many other time constants in the system. For example, the incoming synaptic signal is not just a spike, but it has a rise time and a fall time. We call that the post-synaptic potential. There are delays in the system. So there are many, many, many time constants. But if you work hard, you can build a system where all the time constants are multiplied by the same factor, and you can make that factor very much smaller than one. In our case, it's, it's 10,000. So this is a system which runs at 10,000 times the speed of biology, and time is imposed here by the physics, not by external control. There's no way you could change that to some extent. So this is what, what is reality now. These are the two base chips, the Spinnaker chip on the left and the physical model chip. They look rather unspectacular. Uh, on the right side, you see it looks a bit different. It looks like a tennis court, basically. And the two white areas are the synaptic fields with 100,000 synapses. And the neurons are almost insignificant in terms of silicon real estate, just because there are so few. These systems are really connections and not so much neurons, but of course the neurons are circuit-wise extremely complicated because they have many biological features which I cannot discuss here. Now, of course, the trick is now to scale this up. Is it scalable? Yes, it is, actually. We did that. And this is part, actually, done uh, work in the Human Brain Project over the last two and a half years. Uh, this is a board of Spinnaker chips, 48 chips, which looks like a square almost. It's actually a hexagonal uh, architecture. On the right side, you see the uh, uh, the physical model system, and there's these funny objects in the middle, that's actually a wafer. So here we actually implemented wafer scale integration, where a wafer now carries 200,000 neurons and about 50 million synapses. Now, uh, the next step, of course, is to build systems, and those systems have to be, have been released to the public just a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, almost on the March 30th. Uh, these systems are reality now. You can use them, you can even remotely access them. They look a lot like little supercomputers, but they are not. I mean, these are really fundamentally different computing architectures, the Spinnaker system on the left side and the Heidelberg uh, physical model systems on the right. Now, the question is, what can you do with these things, okay? Is it useful to do useful computation? And, of course, we know that neural networks, you have know, heard a lot about convolutional networks that are now used for deep learning. These kind of neural networks are a very interesting thing, and most of the networks, neural networks that we implement today are what are called deterministic, which is represented by these two dice there which look a bit funny. So you have an input pattern, you have an output pattern, and they are linked by the network, and the network is deterministic. That means if you repeat the experiment, you will always get the same result. Okay, that's the typical way you, you implement neural networks, and uh, of course the configuration of the network has to happen through learning. Now there's another thing, you can go to stochastic networks, which are very important, where you say reality is actually a distribution of patterns. 
And what you, what you do in your network, you have a store, stochastic distribution of patterns, which reflect your prior knowledge, which you have acquired through learning, and then you can use those stored patterns to either generate distributions without any input, or you can do inference, you can be discriminative. You present the pattern, you say, well, I've probably seen that before. Okay? And, and in particular, the generative mode is, is probably a bit difficult to understand, but maybe if you just close your eyes now, you are completely decoupled from the world to some extent, but you can still imagine things like faces, numbers, or stuff like that. So in this moment, there is no input to the network. It has learned before, but now it samples from probability distributions that are actually stored in the system. And we have done all these kind of experiments, and I will show you three examples now in the remaining time. One is deterministic supervised learning. That's kind of the classical thing, and this is an insect here, which, for example, can use has chemical sensors to distinguish between different flowers, which is a important thing in the life of an insect. And so these circuits have been reverse engineered by neuroscientists. This is a work by Michael Schmucker and Al uh, from Sussex. And, um, and uh, we have receptor neurons that respond to, respond to certain chemical substances. Then you have a layer which is called a decorrelation layer, which is basically contrast enhancement. You see that in all perceptual systems in biology. On the right side, you have the association. You now combine the inputs and take a decision on, for example, what kind of flower you have. Of course, you know that that's basically is multivariate data classification. And of course, the trick is to, to configure the links between those two layers, the decorrelation layer and the association layer. And this is done by supervised learning, things like backpropagation, Monte Carlo methods, or others. So you really have to configure the synaptic links. Does it work? Actually, it works very nicely. This is a measurement done on hardware. At the bottom, you see our ends, a lot of dots, which are the firing spikes over time of a, a second or so. And what you see is there it seems to be no information in this. You see, this looks like a random kind of pattern. And there are the, right, the rates plotted on the right. And it's basically a flat distribution. OK, so how can there be any information? Well, what you see is uh, now in the intermediate layer that connects the association to the input layer, there is also spiking activity, but it's rare. It's sparse. And that's a very important thing. That may be one of the reasons why nature has invented spikes. Because it saves energy. Where the cool, interesting computation is being done, the firing rate is actually very, very low. You only have high rate if you sort of code physical signals, input signals. But the computation is done with sparse spiking, which is very important. Then at the output layer, which are the top blue and yellow lines, you see before training is a flat distribution, after training, you see peaks showing up. So the rate codes the output now, and you have done multivariate data classification. Why are there two peaks? Well, because there are actually excitatory inhibitory neuron populations. That's the detail. Let me give you another example, deterministic unsupervised learning. Okay? This, is, this was supervised, of course. You tell the system what it has done is good or bad. And the, the example for unsupervised learning is this bird here, which seems to have two eyes, clearly, but it also has two ears, which you don't see. And what these animals can do, they can look like sound sources, for example. I'll close my eyes, and if I, I'm a bird, an owl, I'm in a, in a dark barn, I can, as a mouse somewhere, I can locate whether it's on the left or on the right side. How can I do that? Because I can measure the phase differences of sound between my two ears. And uh, there is a, a model for that, a biological model, which is very straightforward. So if the mouse is on the right side, there's a short flight path for the sound to the right ear and along to the left ear. And, and it's this phase difference you want to detect. And you do that by a circuit internally that actually looks for coincidences by compensating the short path in air by a long path in the brain. So what you have to do is you have to do the coincidence method, which is often called also heavy and learning, where you detect time coincidences between two input pulses. And if those time coincidences are there, you produce a stronger signal. And that is done in a completely unsupervised way. We did this experiment on real hardware, and you see the learning process there is this colorful plot on the left, where you see how the synaptic weights evolve through the unsupervised learning process. And uh, the amazing thing, what you can do here, these are analog circuits for synapses, and they are lousy. Okay, I mean, this is 180 nanometer analog electronics, which is, of course, a great thing, but they are very, is variability. We heard variability in the first talk. is a very important thing, and things get worse if you go to smaller feature sizes. Uh, our synapse features in these circuits typically vary by 20 to 30 percent. Okay, but, but by this self-calibration, which is performed by unsupervised learning, we can actually do phase detection to 10 nanoseconds with really lousy analog circuits, which is quite impressive. Finally, my last example, stochastic supervised learning. Uh, 
why is this stochastic? Look at this animal here. What is it? You don't really know. It could be a duck or a rabbit, but you only see one at a given time. And this is an example for what I just called sampling. You have this stored probability distribution, probability distribution in your brain, and you take samples. And in this previous example, you just had two options. Okay, you basically just jump between these two options. This can be implemented with Boltzmann machines, and in particular, we do that with spiking Boltzmann machines. Boltzmann machines are a network of symmetrically connected stochastic nodes, where the state of the nodes is described by a vector of binary random variables. So how can a spiking neuron be a binary random variable? Actually, we have developed a theory for that. So zeros and ones are represented by a neuron that is either active or in a so-called refractory state. Now, the probability for the state vector then in these networks converges to a target Boltzmann distribution, which you know from physics, there is an energy in the exponent of the Boltzmann distribution. And this is the classical energy function, which you know, for example, from the Ising model. Here, of course, it's a neural network where W are the, uh, the connecting weights between neurons, and the, the B and the ZI, the minus sign on the left, on the right, is a, is a bias function, which uh, you can switch on or off. Now, how do you train these things? Uh, uh, there is a, a very well uh, established mechanism where you clamp the visible units uh, of the input layer to the value of a particular pattern, and then you wait to reach terminal equilibrium, you increment the interaction between any two nodes that are both on. This is the learning process, which is a slow process, actually. It takes a lot of time, in particular if you run it on conventional computers. And then you can do experiments. You can run the network freely and sample from probability distributions without any input, or you can actually infer about the input from if you clamp certain input variables, which represents, for example, visual input. On the left side, you see a freely running network which has learned to look at numbers, these so-called MNIST numbers. So the network is dreaming, it's in a generative mode, and it does what you just did with these little animals there. You jump between the rabbit and the dog. This network actually jumps between zeros, fours, and threes, and it's almost never in between. And if you look for the jumping statistics, it's pretty much what people report in, in, in experimental psychology. Now you can clamp the input mode, which represents to a visual input, and then you can infer if you clamp, for example, the horizontal bar in the middle, it can only be a four or a three, and certainly not a zero. So this is the inference mode, all right? So I'm almost sure this is a nice example. It's a real hardware experiment where you actually see also the time advantage now of this experiment. The, the, the red bars there represent the learned distribution uh, for just three spiking uh, Boltzmann machine neurons, uh, which can go into eight states. And what you see there is a function of time if the network samples from this distribution that after a while it really represents the learned distribution very well. And, and this is, is happening here in milliseconds, which is really very, very fast to compare to biology. To be a more, bit more specific also numerically, what about the energy consumption of these systems? Now all the systems that are presented are not yet optimized for energy, uh, for energy efficiency, but they are already doing pretty good. You can, for example, measure the energy for a synaptic transmission. So if you look to a biological synapse, that's about 10 to the minus 40 joule, or 10 femto joule. If you look to Markus Diesmann's present uh, simulation on a supercomputer, it's about 0.1 millijoule. Sorry, it's 10 to the 10 is the factor between biology and simulation. There are people doing more elaborate simulations, really having all the biophysics of the cells and the synapses in their model. They have to pay another factor of 10,000 uh, um, in, in energy. So there you have actually a joule for a synaptic transmission. The, the two neuromorphic systems that are presented, the spinnaker system and the brain scale system, they sit at 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 10 joule, which is still huge factors away from biology, but also huge factors, even bigger factors away from conventional computing. So that's certainly a very interesting result. What I, and this is my last slide, would really point out as the most important, to me, aspect of neuromorphic computing is the speed advantage and the fact that you can at least run in real time, if not even in an accelerated mode. And this repeats what you have seen on Terry Sinovsky's code when I started my talk. If you look to nature, uh, there are time scales from sub milliseconds on the synaptic coincidence measurement to years. Okay? These are, it was 11 orders of magnitude on Terry's plot, it's 12 on my list here. Now that is a huge effect. So if you, if you run that in a simulation that runs a factor thousand slower, then, then reality, you can easily look at synaptic plasticity. These are typically experiments that take a couple of thousand seconds, no problem, okay? But it's clear that learning and development particular, development 
means actually active rewiring of the network. It's just totally inaccessible to conventional computer. It would take thousands of years. So, okay, if you have a real-time system, it would take years, which is okay. You can do that, in particular if you do robotic experiments. But we also think that this alternative of having accelerated model is in particular interesting because you can compress a thousand years to a couple of thousand seconds and by that study learning and plasticity, which to me is the key of making use of brain-like networks. You can even think about evolution, but that's maybe a bit science fiction. Conclusion is after 10 years, and this is a 10-year development, of course, I forgot to say that. The Human Brain Project is now two and a half years old, but of course there was previous work which actually was the basis for our work in the Human Brain Project. We have the systems available that are actually reached a high degree of maturity. I didn't talk about the usability software support. That's all available. So if you want to use them, just tell me. They are ready for non-expert use cases. Um, they have a very high degree of configurability with dedicated software tools, but obviously they cannot be a replacement for conventional computers because if you want to just fundamentally change the way of communication, for example, going away from spikes, this would not be possible. Uh, so they are restricted in their use to emulate spiking neural networks. Uh, I think the only way to access multiple timescales present in neural you know, systems is making them functional. You have to let them learn, and I think neuromorphic computing is probably the only way to really do that in a reasonable time. It's well stock suited for stochastic inference, which I think is a very, very important way of doing computing. Coming back to CMOS, I say well suited for the use of deep submicron non-CMOS devices. That's certainly true because there is resilience. Uh, there is the ability to compensate for variability, but I should also say all the experiments I show, or the machines I show, are done with very boring, old-fashioned CMOS 180 nanometer feature size, because that's the only thing we can pay for. So to, to evaluate the architecture, CMOS is perfect, okay? And even to make really functional systems. Once non-CMOS devices come up, and I agree that they are not available today, probably this would be a very nice use case. Thank you very much.